Thank you very much. I think I have a pretty big challenge today, but I think the three words that I've never heard in the same sentence are science, and impact, and inspiration. So I, I, I've got a lot to, uh, to, 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 to do in, in just a short period of time, but one of my main goals is to dispel the myth that science shouldn't just be viewed as a nerd in a lab. Now, if my older sister was here, I'm sure she'd be sitting in the back row and screaming out, no, you're a nerd in the ocean. <laughs> in fact, one of the major goals of all scientific research is to have impact, that it impacts the way that we view a problem uh, scientifically to such an extent that it changes the way society functions. Uh, one common used analogy is that science is much like chopping down a tree. We propose a hypothesis, a tree, and through uh, uh, some systematic tests and models, attempt to, to collect some data that either supports or disproves, chops down that tree. Now, rarely do we happen upon a tree and with one swing of an ax, chop it down. More often than not, we approach a tree with an already substantial notch, and our goal with that more directed experiment is to remove another substantial chunk from that already substantial notch. It's only in times of incredibly good fortune do we find ourselves in a position to go all in and with one swing of an ax knock down a giant sequoia. In May of 2010, I found myself working for a university roughly three hours away from the Gulf of Mexico in which raged the largest oil spill in US waters. Roughly one mile below the sea surface, oil and gaseous hydrocarbons were being emitted into the deep waters at an unprecedented rate. My dean of research brought in about eight of us oceanographers into his office one afternoon, and in no uncertain terms let it be known that our university needed a research presence in this event. Well, as a new professor of 34, my strategy was very simple. Try not to make eye contact. <laughs> <laughs> I was instantly transported back to my days as an undergraduate, and taking organic chemistry, my professor relished in his choice to give pop exams. Not pop quizzes, may I, I will clarify, pop exams. His philosophy was that we should always be on top of all the material all the time, hence pop exams. Well, on certain days, I would approach the classroom, maybe a little less prepared than others, and on those days, I would hope that the first thing that would greet me as I entered the door was not Alex Rowland handing me uh, a, a blue book. Well, on this particular day in May of 2010, I was lucky enough to be not handed a figurative blue book from my dean, and I left that meeting with no obligation to the oil spill and an incredible sense of relief. But it was in two days later, through conversations with colleagues outside the university, that we came to the rather um, uh, um, uh, obvious uh, yet profound conclusion that this was not a normal oil spill of a more refined product from a tanker. Instead, this was raw reservoir fluid being emitted from a geologic hydrocarbon reservoir pretty much unadulterated, and thus, natural gas, more specifically methane, should be a dominant component of what's being released. Now, the seafloor harbors the largest global reservoir of methane. Methane is a very potent greenhouse gas. And there's a significant amount of geologic data that suggests that large natural releases of methane uh, from the seafloor have occurred throughout the history of the planet and influenced climate in a very profound way. My normal research goes to places on the seafloor where we see methane being released today, naturally, much like we see here, so that I can study the dynamics of that process and be able to quantify uh, 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 the reality uh, uh, of this hypothesis. Well, the Deepwater Horizon incident in the Gulf of Mexico provide us the opportunity to, uh, to characterize the fate, the transport, and the transformation of methane from the single largest active release ever observed by human beings. Since uh, at that point, we instantly put together a, a scientific plan. We proposed that plan to the, to the National Science Foundation, and within two weeks found ourselves leading one of the first expeditions uh, to the spill site. Since then, we've led or participated in uh, approximately seven expeditions to the spill site, and through our numerous data collections and efforts to communicate those results to the general public, I've come to learn two things. First, some rather profound and unexpected conclusions were being uh, discovered uh, that would change the way we would forever view this spill, 
future spills in the natural environment as well. And number two, those results were not having any impact. For the discoveries that were being made, they could very well have influenced the decision making for many people who are living along the Gulf Coast. And those discoveries, in, in essence, were not being communicated in nearly the manner in which they needed to be. <clears throat> now, I don't want to say that all scientists communicated poorly in this event. In fact, there was a few that did a fantastic job uh, and communicated very clearly, very concisely, sticking to point and, and communicating what both we were discovering as well as, as well as what we still did not know. But many, including myself at times, did not. And I thought really hard about that and, and why uh, we didn't do such a good job communicating or, in essence, uh, avoided it altogether. And I think it distills down to, uh, to a couple of things. Well, first off, oftentimes in communicating with the general public, uh, the conversation can get very emotional. And in science, we remove emotion from the equation so that we can have a really unbiased interpretation of our results. Science and hugging is just something that, ugh, <laughs> just, we don't like it. But in, in general, really, Scientists view communication oftentimes as just a very difficult, uh, a very messy process. And <clears throat> in, in general, to, to distill it down, what we need to do is we need to be able to bear witness to our findings so that those who need those results most can understand our interpretations. Nowhere is the need to bear witness more apparent than in the case of uh, man-made global climate change. Uh, of the survey results presented here, the simple question was asked, do you think human activity is a significant contributing factor to changing global mean, uh, 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 global mean temperatures? Of the people surveyed, the percentage of the population that had advanced degrees in climate science that were actively collecting and publishing data answered with a near unanimous yes. But as the population transitioned from that M member through scientists with lesser degrees of involvement and finally to the general public, the results approach a scary near 50-50. Clearly, the results of these scientific in investigations are not having the impact which they should. And again, we are called to bear witness to these findings as well as the data which is brought to these, uh, to lay to these uh, interpretations. Thinking about that a little bit more, it reminded me of an email that I received from my sister, uh, a 70 times marathon runner, somebody who's run every day uh, for over the past 13 years, and just a general hardworking and generous human being. In the aftermath of the Boston Marathon, uh, her mar Boston Marathon picture's right behind me, she sent me this email. If I can read from it, she writes, my thoughts are quite occupied by the events in Boston yesterday. I even dreamt of some violent scene with severed limbs everywhere and blood in the streets. I hardly ever remember dreams, so the images are remarkable in many ways. I think about the nature of this crazy thing that I've now completed 66 times and about my own day in Boston five years ago. I think about time, as I so often do when I'm running a long distance, and about the fact that the news footage of the bomb exploding at the finish line so clearly shows the race time of four hours, nine minutes, and some seconds I can't recall now. Watching CNN from my computer from this seat at my desk yesterday, I quickly consulted the list of my marathons which you had compiled. My Boston time was four hours, five minutes, 43 seconds, and so I thought, I would have been through by now, but I would have been right there. I also thought about the insidious nature of the particulars of the timing. Someone knew right about four hours is when the largest percentage of people are finishing the race. This is the range during which the bulk of the amateur field is coming in. Thought about the word amateur a lot. And about the specific choice to do harm to people engaging in a very large, quite spectacular amateur event. Looking it up, I was surprised and delighted to learn where it comes from, ultimately from Latin, of course, as passed down to Old French, meaning lover of. For the love of some indescribable thing, so many interesting or boring or remarkable or plain people are out there doing something somewhat extraordinary. Meanwhile, for the love of those people, so many other interesting or boring or remarkable or plain people are out there bearing witness for just about four hours. When I ran on Sunday in Indiana, there was a crazy fellow with a head full of long reddish curls who followed the race. He'd park every few miles, jump out of his Jeep, put up a huge sign which said, 
doubters can suck it. <laughs> and huge white letters on a red background. And stand there at the side of the road playing a cowbell. He'd hang out while a number of runners pass. Then he'd drive a bit farther along the course and go again. At one point, right around halfway, I think, I said to him, you have no idea how much this helps. He smiled, bobbing his head to the clang of his cowbell. I guess in honor and memory of the events in Boston yesterday, at the finish line of the 117th running of the Boston Marathon, I'd like to work on a rewrite to the Beatitudes. Somewhere in there would be something like, blessed are those who bear witness, for they shall feel the deep and abiding love which they support. In all scientific investigations, especially during the Deepwater Horizon incident, we remove love and emotion from the equation so that we can provide a clear and unbiased interpretation of the results. But only we are behind the closed door of the laboratory or secluded out in the middle of the ocean. So only we have the ability to bear witness to our findings and how they influence the general public. It is here that we must reinstill the love and emotion that we once removed so that we can portray the passion we have for our work and allow our results to have the broadest impacts. Thank you very much. Thank you.